Rita Hayworth may be remembered as a Hollywood femme fatale and pinup icon, but the woman behind the image was very different. A shy young woman pushed into her acting career by the domineering men in her life, Hayworth endured a stream of painful, failed marriages. But for a time she found happiness with the man she called the great love of her life. Born Margarita Carmen Cancino in New York City in 1918, Hayward faced hardship and heartache from her earliest years. When she was just 12 years old, her entertainer father made her his dance partner, making her perform at wild floating casinos. As a child, Hayward was known to be a kind, sweet girl, but a poor student, who eventually came to develop a strong dancing ability like her vaudevillian parents. Her father had performed an act with his sister, billed as the dancing casinos. Recognizing his daughter's ability, Eduardo Cancino decided to revive his old dance act with his daughter as his new partner. He would beat her and, as Hayward later confessed to her second husband Orson Wells, her father would sexually abuse her too. After her father Eduardo had drunk and gambled away their earnings, he would send her out to catch fish for dinner. If she returned empty-handed, he punished her with his fist, always scrupulously careful, however, not to leave any marks for the audience to see. She was rarely seen playing with other children, and had few chances to make friends. Her brothers chose not to protect her. The family moved closer to the Mexican border, to Chula Vista, traveling often to Tijuana where Hayward's father soon had them performing in swanky nightclubs. At the time, as it is now, the 17-year-old age of consent in Mexico was rarely enforced. Hayward and her father could dance for Hollywood big shots like Carl Lemley Jr. and Joseph Schenk in the swank nightclubs of Tijuana. While her brothers played with the neighborhood kids, Leeming rights, Hayward never joined their games, although she often sat on the front porch staring silently ahead or seeming to watch as they played. Neighbor Loretta Parkin told Leeming that she and other kids would often peek into the casino's living room window to catch a glimpse of the mysterious Margarita practicing with her father. He'd scream and holler at her, don't do that. Don't be so stupid. Parkin recalled. He was kind of a small man, like a little banty rooster. I never heard her answer back at him, not ever. She would simply do the routine again, until he was satisfied. Parkin felt awful for the shy little girl. For Rita, there was no life, no school, no friends, no girlfriends, she said. Just sitting, sitting, sitting till it was time to go to Tijuana. And her days of performing were only just beginning. Hayward was discovered by a producer for the Fox Film Company when she was just 16 years old and was performing with her father. In 1937, at not even 20 years old, Hayward married her first husband, Shady used car salesman Eddie Judson. Judson recommended she bury her heritage and change her name to Hayward. Hayward's father had already forced his daughter to dye her hair black to appear more Latin, and now she was being told to go the other way. Her family were furious about the match, as Judson was twice her age, and his intentions were far from pure. I married him for love, but he married me for an investment, Hayward later said, according to Barbara Leeming's 1989 biography, if this was happiness. For five years he treated me as if I had no mind or soul of my own. Judson wanted his wife to be a star, not because she wanted it, but because he had plenty to gain from her success. He helped me with my career, Hayward would say after their marriage ended, and helped himself to my money. Despite Hayward's quiet nature and shyness, Judson forced her to do just about anything to drum up publicity. He also had her change her appearance, using painful hair pulling, electrolysis and scalping treatments to move her hairline back before dyeing it urban, so she looked less Latin. Soon, Hayward was known as the most cooperative girl in Hollywood. But it didn't stop there. Judson was even willing to pimp his wife out to influential men in Hollywood, encouraging her to have sex with them to earn favor in the industry. Her first husband was a pimp. Literally a pimp, Wells told Lehman. When she refused to sleep with one, Columbia studio boss Harry Cohn, who had just signed her at the time, Hayward unknowingly inspired a grudge Cohn would hold for decades. One has to remember that Cohn, who was a Jew, held different beliefs about slavery, since the Talmud repeatedly refers to non-Jews as cattle, who can be treated a variety of ways. See Boba Mizia 114 be the Goyim are not humans. They are beasts. See 2nd century sage Rabbi Shimon Bar Yohei and Isaman, 
the best of the Gentiles should be killed. To get revenge, Kom would treat Hewat with shocking disrespect, using the bathroom in front of her and belittling her constantly, at least according to if this was happiness. All Harry Kohn wanted to do was get even, because he'd never had any sexual encounter of any kind with Rita, which annoyed the hell out of him, her friend Bob Schiffer told Limi. The author describes how the Moga attempted to exact his revenge on the set of 1948's The Lives of Carmen. A maid outside Rita's dressing room reported on exactly who went in and out, and a bug inside picked up Rita's private conversations. Rita had known about the bug for some time, but she also knew that if she tore it out, another would soon take its place. Accordingly, she whispered intimate details that she would not want Cohn to know. But one thing Rita made no attempt to conceal from Harry Cohn was her contempt for him and his studies. She hated them all, said Bob Schiffer. She didn't pull many punches with Cohn as to what she thought of him. Cohn represented all the tyrannical men in Hayward's life, but he was much more than a mere symbol. The two would battle over contracts, script approval, and Hayward's love life until Pa Joey, her final film for Columbia, in 1957. As she got older, she got a little more guts, her friend Ross Rogers told Limi. Underneath she grew. She got stronger and stronger and was able to survive. Back in the 1930s and 1940s, Hayward appeared in a series of films, soon starring alongside Fred Astaire and becoming a household name for her sensual magnetism and talent. A magnificent dancer and entertainer, Hayward lit up when performing. She learned steps faster than anyone I'd ever known, her co-star Fred Astaire said, according to Limi. I'd show her a routine before lunch. She'd be back right after lunch and have it down to perfection. She apparently figured it out in her mind while she was eating. Yet once the work was done, Costa James Cagney remembered, she'd simply go back to her chair and sit there and not communicate a possible indication of the trauma that lay beneath her glitzy persona. She was the femme fatale of the early 1940s, embodying slick, seductive cruelty. In 1942, Hayward would finally divorce Judson, citing cruelty, and reconcile with her family. Less than two years later, she would marry again, this time to the man she called the great love of her life. Director and actor Orson Welles had seen Hayward's pin-up spreads long before he ever met her, and like most people he assumed the real woman would be just like her femme fatale image. The whole wicked Gilda figure, Gilda was the character she played in the film of the same name, was absolutely false. It was a total impersonation, like Lon Chaney or something, Wells later said. The image had tricked Wells. I saw that fabulous still in Life magazine while I was in Brazil, he told Limi where she's on her knees in bed. And that's when I decided, when I come back, that's what I'm going to do. But the truth surprised him, instead of a seductress, the real Hayward was a timid young actress still trying to find her place. Wells had been divorced from his first wife Virginia Nicholson for three years by 1943. He was the father of a daughter and still mourned his mother, a natural born entertainer and concert pianist, whom he lost young. Wells welcomed her into his circle of friends, often pretending to read her mind so she would have to correct him and get her talking. He loved magic and magic tricks, and many awesome Wells tricks can be spotted on YouTube. In 1942, Wells and his friend, actor Joseph Cotton, were putting together the Mercury Wonder Show when he had an idea. The production was a magic show designed to entertain soldiers during World War II. Wells realized he could meet Hayward by casting her as the magician's assistant, he was the magician. She agreed and was even sold in half at each show until the head of Columbia Pictures, where she was signed, told her to stop via the Hollywood Reporter. Still, it was enough for the two to get to know each other, and Hayward would later call Wells the great love of my life. According to Vanity Fair, Hayward enjoyed pulling around with Wells and his compatriots from the Mercury Theater. The pair fell fast, and by 1943 had decided to marry. On September 7, 1943, the 28-year-old Orson Welles secretly whisked Rita Hayward, 25, away from the Columbia studio lot after the day's shooting on the Columbia musical, Cover Girl. At Santa Monica City Hall, Orson Welles and Rita Hayward were married in the presence of best man, Joseph Cotton. I never saw a happier, more tickled, more delighted, adorable couple in the world, Secretary Shifra Haran told Limi. 
there would be no honeymoon, Ewart said she had to get back to the studio, but for a time they would be one of the happiest pairs in Hollywood. Both eager to escape the spotlight, Ewart and Wells moved to a mansion and planned their escape from the pressures of Hollywood. He would go into politics, filming South America on various missions for the U.S. State Department and she would do anything other than the acting career she'd been pushed into. The newlyweds settled in a Brentwood mansion, where Wells built a roofless solarium so he what could sunbathe naked. Together they plotted their escape from Hollywood, attempting to launch Wells' political career, which, according to Lee Min, was urged on by none other than President Roosevelt. She hated being a movie star, Wells said. She never got a moment's pleasure out of being a famous movie star. It gave her nothing. Eager to please her intelligent, accomplished new husband, Hayward did everything in her power to be the perfect partner. She would read his books, support his political goals, carry his child. I really wanted to be everything Orson wanted of me, she later told movie star June Allison, who recounted it to biographer Limi. Sadly, it wouldn't be enough. According to Hayward, Wells wasn't ready for married life and all it entailed. During the entire period of our marriage, he showed no interest in establishing a home. When I suggested purchasing a home, he told me he didn't want the responsibility, she said. Mr. Wells told me he never should have married in the first place, that it interfered with his freedom in his way of life. When Hayward was pregnant with their daughter Rebecca, who was born in 1944, Wells became entangled with heiress Gloria Vanderbilt, who was also married at the time. The self-destructive, egocentric Wells soon began to leave Hayward, then pregnant with their daughter Rebecca, to Konuda with the heiress in a corridor at 21 in New York City. Something happened when our eyes met, Gloria Vanderbilt, who was there with her own husband at the time, later recalled. Under the table he kept touching my knee, and soon we were holding hands. She wasn't the only one. Behind closed doors, Wells reportedly began an affair with Judy Garland, supposedly visited sex workers and became less attentive to his wife. One has to be very careful with Wells' rumors. Newspapermen plagued him after 1941 Citizen Kane and tried to set him up in hotels with underage girls for a huge scoop. He was tipped off by a hotel worker to this practice and forever exercised caution afterwards. He also became increasingly disturbed by Hayward's neediness, drinking, and explosive temper. Wells told Limin how Hayward flew into a rage after discovering that her picture had been affixed to the nuclear test bomb, named Gilda, detonated at Bikini Atoll. Rita almost went insane, she was so angry, he said. She was so shocked by it, she wanted to go to Washington to hold a press conference, but Harry Cohn wouldn't let her because it would be unpatriotic. By 1946 they were separated, when Hayward moved into her home with the couple's daughter Rebecca, according to The Hollywood Reporter. It was Hayward who would file for divorce. Shortly after, actress Shelley Winters remembered going to a Christmas party with Hayward, which Lemin describes. At the crowded party Winters lost track of Rita. Later when she asked actress Eva Gardner if she had seen her, Eva pointed to a bed where Rita lay fast asleep beneath a pile of fur coats. She had been so lonely and bored that she dozed off, and Eva Gardner had draped the fur coat over her. When Shelley Winters came close to Rita to make sure she was all right, she could see that her hair and face were a mess. She'd been weeping. In 1947, Wells and Hayward worked together on the San Francisco-based Lady of Shanghai. Wells encouraged Hayward to cut her hair in a slick bob for the role and dyed it blonde. But this film, with its topsy-turvy plot lines, did not seem to bring them closer together. As in the end of the film, Wells would walk away from his beloved muse. For her part, Hayward began to drink, becoming more volatile until she filed for a divorce which was granted in 1947. Prior to her divorce from Wells, Hayward starred in the film Gilda in 1946, playing one of her most provocative and iconic roles. The intense cinematography of Gilda reminds one of Wells' films, and one wonders if he was trying to be controlling as he so often was, behind the camera. It was a performance as singing, dancing, tragic Gilda Monson Ferro that would define public view of the actress, and follow her for years to come. After her second divorce, Hayward would marry three more times, and divorce just as many. She also had several affairs, often with her leading men. But none of her romances lasted, 
something Hayward blamed in part on her image as a Hollywood femme fatale. Men go to bed with Gilda, but awaken with me, Hayward famously said once. Basically, I am a good, gentle person, but I am attracted to mean personalities. Married five times, Hayward would have affairs with Howard Hughes, Victor Mature, David Niven and Kirk Douglas. Yet she found little solace in her relationships. I felt something deep within her I couldn't help, loneliness, sadness, something that would pull me down, Douglas would recall after their tryst, according to Lime. I had to get away. But Hayward could not escape her past or problems, run though she did. You see what she was, second husband Orson Wells told Lime. All her life was pain. In 1948, after her divorce from Wells, Hayward went on a European vacation. Dressed in a Pierre Bomber dress inspired by a costume worn by Francoise de Montespan, mistress of King Louis XIV, she appeared at a charity ball at the Eiffel Tower. There she nervously gave an endearing speech in French on behalf of poor children, enthralling a royal in the audience, the legendary Lotario Prince Ali Khan. Prince Ali Khan, whom Limin describes as a Cosanova, Sybarite, gentleman jockey, auto racer, hunter, pilot, horse breeder, soldier and Muslim religious leader, was the son of the Aga Khan, the imam of millions of Asian and African Ismaili Muslims. Although he was married, Khan soon convinced famous hostess Elsa Maxwell to introduce him to Hayward. He pursued the reluctant star across the French Riviera, filling her suites with flowers, and buzzing her hotels in his private plane. According to Limin, he even allegedly sent a fortune teller to the superstitious Hayward to tell her to be with him. Eventually, Hayward was persuaded. The charming prince was a way out of Hollywood, and he also happened to be excellent in bed. According to Limin, Ali practiced an eastern art of love, which allowed him to exercise indefinite control in the bedroom. The affair would scandalize the state post-war West, leading to Hayward's condemnation by everyone from the American Federation of Women's Clubs to the Vatican. After both had obtained divorces, a wedding was planned for May 27, 1949. Since French law demanded marriages take place in public, their wedding party, in the Valoris Town Hall, consisted of seven princes, four princesses, a Maharaja, a Gekva, an Imaya, along with 30 journalists, Liming writes. Thousands of French citizens lined the streets, eager to catch a glimpse of the new princess. At the elaborate reception that followed at the prince's magnificent chateau overlooking the Mediterranean, Hayward, secretly pregnant with their daughter Yasmin, didn't seem happy in the words of gossip columnist Luella Parsons. Polymin, she found a similarly glum Aga Khan, whose overindulgence had resulted in an upset stomach. Too much caviar, Rita, he said. Too much caviar. Prince Ali Khan was a son of Sultan Maham Shah, Aga Khan III, the leader of the Ismaili sect of Shia Islam. She left her acting career for the marriage and had one child with him, Princess Yasmin Aga Khan. Once again, Hayward attempted to mold herself to suit her man. She was tutored in French, etiquette, royal protocol and, parliament, the mysteries of being a princess. The pair would divorce after Con was seen with actress Joan Fontaine. But the sociable and womanizing prince, before he was officially divorced from Hayward, he would woo Joan Fontaine, Yvonne De Carlo, and Jean Tierney who you can learn more about on this channel, had not changed at all. Hayward was soon his arm candy at an exhausting round of society events. During one at the Tillery's Gardens, Hayward fainted when autograph seekers crushed around her. She collapsed near Maurice Chevalier, whose tuxedo was splashed by an overturned bottle of champagne, Liming writes. My new suit is ruined. Chevalier was heard to cry out, as others, more gallant than he, rushed to revive the actress with a bit of brandy. Targeted by jewel thieves, would be kidnappers, and paparazzi, Hayward began to lock herself in her room during Khan's endless high society house parties, drinking and dancing alone to her Spanish record collection. She also became erratic and irrational during the couple's frequent fights. Limin writes, When she declared that she was sick of life with Ali and wanted to go back to America, the prince calmly accused her of having been drinking. Infuriated, Rita began throwing things at Ali, picture frames, books, and then having dramatically summoned one of the household staff to fetch her a glass or orange juice, she flung the contents in Ollie's face. Terrified the prince would take custody of Princess Yasmin, 
In March 1951, Hayward spirited her daughters from Europe back to New York. When asked by a journalist what she was going to do in America, Hayward replied, the first thing I'm going to do is have a hot dog. Hayward was granted a divorce in 1953 on the grounds of extreme cruelty, entirely mental in nature. After Ali, Rita was on a downward path, a steep, steep, toboggan slide, well stood leaming. He kept in touch with the mother of his daughter and noted her bipolar tendencies. Despite this concern, he doesn't seem to have stepped up and provided a home for his daughter, Rebecca Wells. That same year, Hayward married singer Dick Hames, who was deep in debt, nicknamed Mr. Evil and had no solid proof of American citizenship. Hayward dealt with this, footing the bills for much of his debt during their tumultuous two-year marriage, which ended after he struck her in the face in public at the Coconut Grove during a night of drinking in 1955. She had temporarily lost her daughters to the state. I could hardly believe I could be a princess one minute and be treated like that the next, she told June Allison, according to Limi. By that time, Hayward was raising both her daughters, one with Wells, one with Con, and dealing with her own financial issues. She ended up marrying film producer James Hill in 1958, before divorcing in 1961. She claimed mental cruelty why he alleged the marriage ended because he wanted her to continue acting while she desperately wanted to leave Hollywood. By the early 1960s, Hayward began to display symptoms of early-onset Alzheimer's. Unfortunately, her confusion and fading memory were misdiagnosed by her friends and family as severe alcoholism. On the set of The Wrath of God in 1972, her ability to memorize lines had completely evaporated. I take her into her room and I teach her one line, makeup artist Lindell Kell told Limi. Then she'd go out and they'd shoot the one line. And then we'd go back into the room and do another line. Her children grown, a lonely Hayward would let her dogs out in the middle of the night in Beverly Hills, hoping to talk to neighbors. Often, neighbor Glenn Ford, her coaster in Gilda, would come at night to keep a confused Hayward company. She often became violent, once throwing a drink in dancer Adele Astaire's face in front of Adele's brother, Fred. Another night, she invited fellow movie star and Miller and a friend to dinner, only to chase them away with a butcher knife, screaming, how dare you invade my private property. I don't see autograph seekers. The next day she called me, Miller told Limin, and said, why didn't you come for dinner? Hayward first dead showing signs of early onset Alzheimer's in the 1960s, though she wouldn't be diagnosed until 1980. In the years leading up to her diagnosis, the actress became erratic, forgetful and sometimes violent. In the 1980s she disappeared from an appearance in Brazil, only to be discovered soon after sitting on a beach watching children fly kites. With her children grown and a string of failed marriages behind her, Hayward had few companions until her daughter Princess Yasmin moved in to care for her in the 1980s. It was the outburst. She'd fly into a rage. I can't tell you. I thought it was alcoholism, alcoholic dementia. We all thought that, Yasmin said of the years before her mother's diagnosis. You can't imagine the relief just in getting a diagnosis. We had a name at last, Alzheimer's. Of course, that didn't really come until the last seven or eight years. She wasn't diagnosed as having Alzheimer's until 1980. There were two decades of hell before that. In her mother's final years, Yasmin would describe Hayward as is still beautiful, but it's a shell. Even Wells, the greatest love of Hayward's life, was a stranger to her when she saw him in the 1980s at an event. When it was over, I came over to her table, and I saw that she was very beautiful, very reposed looking, and didn't know me at first, he once said. After about four minutes of speaking, I could see that she realized who I was, and she began to cry quietly. It was always a point of pride to Wells that their marriage had been the longest in Hayward's life. Hayward died in 1987, following complications associated with her Alzheimer's. Though she died single, Wells was widely regarded as the greatest love of her life. Liming wrote of their relationship, Rita told him, you know the only happiness I've ever had in my life has been with you. Wells was overwhelmed with guilt about how badly he had treated her and with sadness at the perspective this gave him on her life. If this was happiness, he would later say of their marriage, 
imagine what the rest of her life had been. Though her life had been a sad and complicated one, well saying all her life was pain, he remembered her only in the best terms. The divorce seemed to bother him particularly. In April 1982, when interviewer Marv Griffin asked him about his religious beliefs, Wells replied, I try to be a Christian. I don't pray really, because I don't want to bore God. On the evening before his death in 1985, two years before he walked past, Wells called her one of the dearest and sweetest women that ever lived. The following are excerpts from their love letters. Dearest angel girl, I suppose most of us are lonely in this big world but we must fall tremendously in love to find it out. The cure is the discovery of our need for company, I mean company in the very special sense we've come to understand since we happened to each other, you and I. The pleasures of human experience are emptied away without that companionship, now that I've known it, without it joy is just an unendurable sorrow. You are my life, my very life. Never imagine your hope approximates what you are to me. Beautiful, precious little baby, Hurry up the sun. Make the days shorter till we meet. I love you, that's all there is to it. Your boy. Orson. Dearest baby. I knew it would be lonely, but this is even lonelier that I let myself fear. I'm too blue for anything but the sonorous repetition of my love for you. Oh how much there is of it, I walked till midnight. And what happened to me, Miss Parsons, New York gossip columnist, sat at a table by the door so I made Lenny, Leonard Lyons, columnist for the New York Post, or write an avidivac to my innocence, in case she prints I'm out on the town without you. This is going to be my last saloon till you get here. 3.30 a.m., coffee kicking in, the late traffic yawns in the echoing streets below. The wind whistles, the rain drips. Look, I can't even write. Sweet one, I can't live without you, 